So I would like to welcome everyone to our evening uh, presentation, um, Balanced Ventilation in a Passive House. I'm very excited to, uh, uh, to be part of uh, today's presentation because we will uh, learn about our most pressing questions like why ventilate or the significance of moisture and air contaminants in homes. Or another very good question, why are windows not the tool of choice? So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Kara Rosemeyer, who is a board member of Passphos Institute New Zealand and director of the Passphos Academy in New Zealand. She teaches part-time um, in the architecture department at Unitech in Oakland. Her PhD thesis uh, looked at healthy and affordable housing in New, New Zealand, uh, specifically into the role of ventilation. So we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please uh, post the questions into the chat box and we'll take them uh, at the end. Um, we will record the session and make that available on our website, nypasspost.org. You can go there and also join us as a member, uh, support our efforts like today, and um, we will hopefully organize many more uh, presentations. So without any further de uh, delay, I would like to uh, hand over to, to you, Kara. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andreas. Um, so nice to see so many names, at least, if not faces. So how are things on the East Coast of the United States currently? No one dares to reveal themselves? Okay, um, so I was very sorry to, to hear about the, well, the high toll that the pandemic uh, took uh, for you guys. Um, so yeah, it's, it's with scary times we're living in. Um, and ventilation will, will not solve all the problems in the world, but at least perhaps uh, we can we can make the indoor conditions of houses that we are to experience in the future more often uh, a bit more pleasant for everyone. If you have any questions at all or want to dispute things, um, just feel free to unmute yourselves and let's have a chat about things. Okay, let's talk about balanced ventilation and the passive house. Um, by the way, if you hear banging in the background. Um, it's not from people I locked into my closet. Well, I would say that if there were people locked in my closet, wouldn't I? Um, it's either my neighbor on the top of me remodeling their apartment or my neighbor to the right rebuilding their deck. The joys of working from home. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is the reasons why we need to ventilate and how to ventilate right so that we do not lose the force and not waste heat. And then we have to look into options for distributing fresh air uh, to the spaces where we need it. So why do we need to ventilate? Um, funnily enough, up to the 19th century, people considered the purpose of breathing solely to be a cooling of the heart. But we learned later that the quality of the air that we breathe is also rather important for our well-being. And the reason we ventilate our buildings is the provision of good quality air. Now, one of the problems we have in doing so is that we don't have any inbuilt sensors for poor indoor air quality. Um, not all indoor air contaminants are smelly. Some are though um, bioaffluents, uh, funny, nice word uh, um, for people smell. Um, they can be detected by our senses, but other indoor air contaminants are harder to detect without instruments such as radon, um, the second highest cause of lung cancer after smoking. <laughs> Now, moisture <clears throat> is not per se an indoor air contaminant, um, but it can cause mold and mold spores may cause adverse health effect. Uh, so a ventilation system needs to distribute an adequate amount of outdoor air and preferably filtered as outdoor air is not always pristine to dilute contaminants sufficiently, keep moisture at a level that prevents mold growth and doing all this while not neglecting thermal comfort and energy efficiency. Now to achieve good indoor air quality outcomes, we ought to start with avoiding substances or processes that emit pollutants. Um, 19th century hygienist Max von Pankover famously said that there's no point in optimizing your ventilation 
when you have a compost heap in your living room. But when it comes to harmful substances that don't have a strong smell, this is easier said than done, as we don't know enough about most things we bring into our indoor environments. Um, next up is containment, using coatings and extraction at the source. But where we really have the greatest control is dilution to keep pollutant concentrations within a target range to not be harmful for us. So dilution really is the ultimate thing we can do for indoor air quality. So, and for diluting air, we need to ventilate. Um, so what options do we have to ventilate homes energy efficiently and get good indoor air quality outcomes? Before we consider this question, um, let's get some terminology right. Um, natural ventilation, I really don't like that term. Um, doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. First of all, what's unnatural ventilation in contrast, right? Um, but also, what's natural about someone opening a window? Um, what most people mean when they talk about natural ventilation is a mixture of air leakage and manual ventilation. Um, I reckon free running buildings or free running ventilation as a not mechanically forced is a better term for this. If you exclude mechanical forces from the equation, well then stack effect or effect or wind effect um, remain as potential drivers for an air exchange in building. Um, the difficulty with excluding mechanical forces as a means of ventilation is to get just the right amount of air exchanged. Too little means insufficient dilution of contaminants. Too much means excessive use of energy and loss of thermal comfort. And if we want to use natural forces for ventilating buildings, we have to adjust our behavior constantly, as these forces have quite different effects, whether a room is windwards or leeward's, whether it's on the ground floor or on a higher floor, whether there are adjacent buildings or geographical features and so forth. Is it even possible to get good outcomes for indoor air quality with infiltration? Um, well, surely we have a quantity problem there and this is literally a back of the envelope calculation to gauge the magnitude of this quantity problem. Um, I'll be reading out the metrical values here as I still find IP values too confusing and cubic feet still sound like a podiatry concern rather than a measure of volume to me. But I added some IP values for your ease of understanding here. All right, let's see what we have here. Um, let's see, we have a, a house or apartment with a floor area of 150 square meters. And let's see, we have a clear height of 2.4 meters. Um, then we'll end up with a volume of the enclosure of uh, 360 cubic meters. When in our building code, you, you're supposed to exchange the air uh, at a rate of 0.35 per hour. And as our code is based on ASHRAE 62, a very old edition of it, um, I assume there's some similar provision in, in your code. So that leads to um, an, an volume that we need to change, exchange every hour of 126 cubic meters. Um, so the next line down here is simply converting my cubic meter per hour into cubic meters per second. So that means I need to exchange 0.035 cubic meter every second. Um, now, if in a, in, a, in a moderate climate with a, a, in a low rise building, it's mainly wind that I have available um, as the driver for air exchange. On a calm day, I have wind speeds up to 0.3 meters per second. Um, so I went with 0.2 meters per second here. And what I got out of my calculation is I need um, a hole the size of 1.75 square meters. And it's easy to, yeah, to understand that this is slightly smaller than an A2 um, sheet. So this is the size of the hole that I need um, to comply with my fresh air requirements on a calm day. 
obviously it's no use if I have this hole somewhere in my bathroom. I need to well sort of slice this, cut this hole up and, and distribute it evenly throughout my enclosure if because I don't, it's no use if I have lots of fresh air in my bathroom and not much fresh air in my living room. Obviously also, but we'll also play into this with the in terms of outcomes for individual rooms is the wind direction and where the room, how the rooms are positioned in this regard. Okay, so, but this is the size of hole that I need to comply with just mathematically with my uh, fresh air requirement. What happens to that size hole if I have a fresh breeze? And a fresh breeze is um, eight to 7 10.7 meters per second. So I went with 10 meters per second here. So, and if um, I have that wind on my hole, then um, what I get in as air through my hole is um, 6,300 cubic meters per hour. That's a lot, right? So, and 6,300 cubic meters per hour, if I needed to heat this up and I went with a um, heat capacity of air 0.33 here, and I also went with, well, 20 degrees um, inside temperature and five degrees outside temperature. So that will be 68 Fahrenheit, 41 Fahrenheit for you. And um, I came up with a value that I need as heating power to heat up that my 6,300 cubic meters per hour. I need heating power of 31.2 kilowatts. So that's 16 2 kilowatt oil column heaters to heat up the air coming through my hole when it is 5 degrees or 41 Fahrenheit um, on the outside. That's a whole lot of heating power that I need, right? And well, let's, let's just also, let's also look at, well, this isn't actually but we're only talking fresh breathe here, right? So it would be, this would be even more severe, would need even more heaters uh, to heat up the, just the air that gets through my hole if I'm in a strong breeze or near gale. We have a quantity problem here if we're trying to, if we're trying to ventilate with infiltration, it's, well, it's either too little or too much. And not surprisingly, um, I did not find a correlation between the air tightness of houses and measured indoor air quality in houses I did research in. Uh, but there is a striking difference between houses that use continuous mechanical ventilation systems and houses that rely on leaks and someone opening the windows for fresh air. So these are two houses in Auckland, similar climate um, that I measured. They're all three bedroom houses. They're all, they're both lived in by a family of four. Um, the Fretline house has an addition to the four people, a dog living on the in, inside um, Blue Line house. They had a pet rabbit in addition to four people. Um, Blue Line house, um, at 50 pascal pressurization, air change rate was 5.3 per hour. Redline house at 50 pascal pressure pressurization, um, the result was 0.6 air changes per hour. So significantly more airtight the building. But the, uh, look at the outcomes. Um, so internationally, you you recommend it's recommended that you stay below a thousand ppm concentration CO2 concentrations on the interior and the red line house comfortably meets that <clears throat> the blue line house occasionally exceeds this by a factor of 10. Uh, now this these uh, numbers these these were measurements from a week in August um, you've got to be aware that August is is a winter month um, in Auckland, so it's it's the often the coldest time of the year. So people, if people op do open their windows, they let in a lot of cold air, and that's why they they only do it um, they only do it if they have to. Um, so you can see here, it's it's with intermittent ventilation, you get you get peaks and bellies, um, but you overall you get a large portion of your time uh, above what you want for good in rare quality 
Um, yeah, so there is a striking difference there. And next to the quantity problem, we have a quality problem, right? Are we getting good quality air into our houses through leaks and cracks? So if the if the air is coming in from the subfloor, you'll get more moisture, possibly radon, insected sites in with your supposedly fresh air. If so, from the, the buildings that we measured in New Zealand, um, on average, 13% um, of the air leaked in through the internal uh, to the door to the internal access door to the garage. So everything that's in the garage, then it's motor fumes, paint fumes, fertilizers, pes pesticides, whatever you store there that will be in the incoming ear. Um, if air leaks in from the roof, there could be lots of things that you really don't want in your, in your environment, um, in your fresh air. But even if it's just coming from outside, um, there could be traffic fumes, there could be pollen, there could be dust, there could be ozone in the income ear that leaks in through cracks. Um, and the thing is, you don't have its infiltration, you have no means of filtering these things out. So rather than creating a problem for in air quality, air tightness is a precondition for any ventilation system to work as intended. Trying to get directional airflow or airflow into spaces where you want it when your building envelope is a sieve is just utterly futile. And there are other good reasons to keep your thermal envelope as airtight as possible. Uh, with air leakage, you have an increased risk of interstitial condensation, uh, warm moist air condensing on the, its passage to the outside somewhere on a cold surface. You have un uncontrolled an indoor environment. You cannot control humidity, contaminant ingress or air flows if your building envelope is a sieve. Um, fire uh, needs needs air, uh, smoke travels with air, so you'll also have an increased risk of fire and smoke propagation. You have larger forces for rain penetration because well what what a leaks what a leaky envelope will do it will will create a pump effect at your um, building envelope. Um, sound travels with air, so you have increased sound transmission, you have poor thermal comfort and you have higher energy cost. So there are lots of reasons to make your building as airtight as possible. And there are really no downsides. So airtight buildings are not worse for in rare quality outcomes. Cross ventilation that, is, that you often see advertised as a way of achieving good air change rate does sometimes lead to unattended uh, outcomes, right? So this kid here will certainly not be happy with the inner air quality, um, inner air quality that's achieved by cross ventilating those two rooms. But it could also be a kitchen here on the left and someone's frying fish or it could be a toilet. Um, because you're right at the mercy of the wind, it's difficult to predict what will happen at any point in time. Um, there's just a lack of control over airways, but also over quantities. Um, so just to, just to wrap this up, the, the question of whether natural ventilation is something that was, leads to good outcomes. So for my research, I also model trickle vents and passive stack options to see if they lead to good inner air quality outcomes. The results I've seen for low rise building in a mild climate at least were very much correlated with wind speed still at the location. So the stack effect was almost immaterial, it was completely overridden by wind. <clears throat> this will be different for a colder climate or in a high rise building, um, but I still doubt that you get uh, reliable outcomes by any passive means. So yeah, you can use <clears throat> You can ventilate using windows, um, but it really is a job, yeah. So you gotta you gotta keep doing it. You gotta keep on it. You gotta be vigilant, right? And just as you can do your laundry manually, um, you can do your ventilation manually. 
But really, why would you if there's a machine available that does this a lot more conveniently, more energy efficiently, and just does a better job at it? Continuing with terminology, uh, mechanical ventilation is not the same as air conditioning. Uh, you can condition mechanically forced air, but that's only an option. So strictly speaking, mechanical ventilation only means you use mechanical force to move air. Yeah, conditioning is optional. The great advantage that you have with mechanical forces is that your ventilation is continuous. Um, and as indoor air pollutants build up pretty quickly, it needs to be continuous for best effect. So in the top left picture here, you see a room where all the stale air was just completely exchanged. Um, there's a mannequin and sitting here that exhales CO2 like a human would. So and after 25 minutes, you see that, well, a third of the room has already concentrations above 1,000 ppm. Um, and if you want to keep uh, your CO2 concentrations at below 1,000 ppm, um, as you should, um, it's almost time to have another complete air exchange. Yeah? If you ventilate, intermittently, there will therefore be times when your indoor air quality isn't great. So that's the big advantage of continuous ventilation and continuous ventilation can only be done effectively with um, mechanical forces. So what can we do to get continuous ventilation? Well, the simplest form would be using a continuous extract fan, which can be ducted to your uh, wet rooms, kitchen bathrooms, um, and then provide makeup air via trickle vents or passive vents to your living rooms and bedrooms. So that would uh, entail continuous ventilation and you would get better humidity and CO2 control with such a system. And to a degree, this would be directional. So a friend of mine did some measurements on their trickle vents um, to see what the impact of wind, and there still is, wind still has an impact on how much air comes in there, um, but it's a lot better than, than the, the free-flowing, uh, free-running um, alternatives. And the other advantage is it's a simple system that can easily be retrofitted, um, but there are also disadvantages. Um, you can't have heat recovery with such a system. Um, well, as I said, control over airways is not complete. Um, and while those trick events may come with some sound attenuation, um, it's not optimal for your acoustics. And as the incoming air is cold air, uh, you also don't get really good comfort outcomes with a system such as this. Enter balance systems with heat recovery. And that's what we really want uh, for um, passive houses. So what are the requirements for such systems that are passive house certified? One requirement is that your fresh, the fresh air temperature is at the minimum of 16.5 degrees Celsius. Um, when it's minus 10 degrees outside. So that's pretty severe cold on the outside and still reasonably warm that the fresh air needs to come in with. Um, the effective dry heat efficiency must be more than 75%. And the thing is the 75% um, for passive houses, they're measured slightly differently than what you would, what you see sometimes um, how efficiency is measured. Sometimes the way efficiency is measured, your, your heat recovery is more efficient if your, if your um, system is leaky. Yeah, because if you do the measurements in a warm environment, then, then air leaks will contribute seemingly to the temperature gains. And um, also if your, your system isn't sufficiently insulated, then this will seemingly contribute to efficiency gains. Uh, and lastly, if your fans are, are very inefficient and, and create a lot of waste heat, that may also artificially 
increase your your the efficiency of the heat recovery. So the way that passive house measures efficiency is different and it excludes all these things. Um, the total electrical efficiency of your system must be less than 0.45 watt hours per cubic meter of air that you move. There are also acoustic requirements. Um, so with, in the room where your appliance is set up, you must not exceed um, uh, 35 decibel at the human uh, adjusted scale. For living in bedrooms, it must be less than, you, the maximum is 25 decibel. Functional rooms, uh, maximum is 30 decibel. Not all, not all air handling units achieve these values out of the box, which means sometimes you're required to house them somewhere in a cupboard or somewhere separately uh, to achieve the outcomes for acoustics. Um, now for, um, for incoming air, there is a filtration requirement F7. Um, there's a new international standard now. It's EPM1, I think is what that translates to. And the exhaust air is also filtered. That's mainly to keep your, to keep your heat exchanger core uh, free of buildup from things. And then there's a requirement for um, standby consumption that should be less than one watt. Um, to give you an idea of what that equates to, so um, a, a small house, uh, 125 square meter uh, floor area, would the, the fan power needed would be approximately 38 hours with an efficient system. And assuming you're using your ventilation for 300 days, 24 hours and assuming that the rest of the days in the year is, is the, the outdoor conditions are so nice that you could just open all your windows permanently. Um, um, then you would consume with your, to run your system, you would consume 274 kilowatt hours per year. Or if you spread this over the floor area, it would be 2.19 kilowatt hours. I'm not quite sure what you are paying for the kilowatt hour electricity. We pay about 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So for us here to run the system would cost um, about $82 a year. And so this for the your $82 a year, you could get all your good indoor air quality outcomes. But there's one other thing you get, you get heat recovery. And so for a quite efficient heat pump, um, I know that manufacturers are advertising values that are higher, but really the best you can hope for as seasonal performance factor is something between three and four. Yeah, seasonal performance factor or coefficient of performance between three and four would be a pretty good value for a heat pump. Now they measured seasonal performance of heat recovery ventilation system in 32 passive houses in Hanover, Germany. And the average that they measured there was 16.5. So 16.5 means one kilowatt hour um, electricity invested uh, recovers 16.5 kilowatt hours heat. So that is far, far, far better than what you get with a very good heat pump. So not only, not only do you get good indoor air quality, it also really makes economic sense to do it. So what are properties of passive house ventilation system? First of all, and that's important to note in, in the, the times of COVID is you're not allowed to use recirculated air, right? So it's it's always outdoor air. Yeah, you're not recirculating air. And by default, there's no conditioning. And in a passive house, um, for 90% of the year, you wouldn't need any conditioning either. But there is the option to pre-warm or pre-cool to cover climate extremes. All air is filtered. Um, Ventilation is possible while windows are closed. So that means you're protected from noise, insects, and there's improved security. 
but in the past of hours, you still require to have not all, but but some operable windows. Um, so she will safeguard that you can still ventilate um, when you have a power outage or that you can open windows to enjoy the other benefits that windows bring in connection to um, the outdoors, etc. So you really have a choice. Um, in a house without mechanical ventilation, you don't have a choice. If you don't open your windows, you get poor outcomes for your indoor air quality. Um, in a house with a mechanical ventilation system, you have choice. Okay, looking at a, um, an air handling unit and what do you typically find there? So you're extracting air from your bathroom kitchen uh, that gets filtered before it uh, moves on to a heat exchanger. In the heat exchanger, it meets outdoor air that also gets filtered. And so they meet, but they're sort of separated. They're separated by some form of mask. You'll, you'll know the drill with, with separation, right? So they are separated by a thin membrane but they, they, well, if you have the right form of heat exchanger, then it's possible for the, for the warmth of the extract air to, well, be donated to the outdoor incoming air and then become supply air. Now, here, the temperature of air should be at a, at the, a minimum of 16.5 degrees, um, but that might not be enough um, in climate extremes, or that might not be enough for your comfort requirements. By the way, the more efficient your heat recovery, the higher the temperature here will be. So 16.5 is the minimum. If you have heat recovery efficiencies above um, 90%, uh, then you should see rather 18 degrees here. Um, so that might not be enough uh, for your comfort requirements, um, but um, then you can heat this up um, higher to meet your needs and this will then be supplied to the rooms. All right, so this is well, a blow up of, your heat, of an efficient heat exchanger core. You can see it's, it's sort of a honeycomb structure there. It's re and it's really constructed in a way uh, to maximize surface contact to enable that heat transfer but well, again, um, particularly in our times, it's important to know that this uh, membrane here is impermeable for things such as viruses and bacteria. So while these airways are pretty close to each other, they're not, they don't physically meet, so they maintain their physical distancing. Um, in, in severely cold climates, um, it might make sense to make them semi-permeable, this membrane semi-permeable for humidity. So if you have very cold winters um, and you're continuously ventilating, um, one of the downsides may be that your interior ear becomes too dry. Um, and um, to prevent this, you can make this membrane semi-permeable. So there are systems with a membrane that's semi-permeable to water molecules. So water molecules can then, well, they'll, they, there's a, there's a um, typically, well, there are more than one ways of doing this, but one way is this membrane is laced with a salt and the salt will absorb moisture from outgoing air and then will moisturize the incoming air um, so that you just deal with the problem of too dry air in winter. Okay, so how do I get my fresh air, nice fresh air to where I want it in the enclosure? Um, the typical ventilation out, uh, layout in a passive house is cascading. So air is supplied to living and bedrooms, uh, using, if smart, smart people use the Kwanda effect, and we have a look at what that is in a minute, um, to supply fresh air to uh, living and bedrooms. And then air is extracted from kitchen and bathrooms. And, um, and so that requires 
transfer openings, that requires that well, the ear can get back to where it is extracted. If this was blocked here, this was blocked here, and you would continue to supply there and continue to extract here, then all remaining leakages with the magnitude of infiltration heat loss there would just become very severe and the same here, uh, or there would be exfiltration here and infiltration here. Um, and also your fans would need to work that much harder because, well, you're basically blowing up your interior and, and the fan would need to work much harder against it. And this fan here would need much work much harder to um, get any air out. So having this for a balanced ventilation system, these transfers are really very important. Now, some people think that it would be better to not use, go with a cascading system, um, a ducted cascading system. And they think that ductless ventilation is the way to go. Um, I disagree there. Um, we can have a discussion about this later or now if you want. Um, but I would recommend going with a ducted system in almost all cases because there are clear advantages. With a cascading system, you get different outcomes for different rooms, but that's typically also what you want. So typically your bathroom, kitchen, um, um, they're not the largest rooms in your enclosure, but all air needs to go through there. So you get, you get pretty high air change rates for kitchen and bathroom, but that's, that's actually a good thing because this is where moisture and most of um, contamination is created. So you're extracting it there from the source directly with quite a high air change rate. And then with the other rooms, you'll have to you'll have to see, you'll have to adjust this to need. You have to see how are those rooms used, how much air do I need to provide there to still get good um, air change rates for the rooms. Oh. Going back to my transfer opening. So the air needs to get from the supply rooms back to the extract rooms. And this has to happen without incurring much of a pressure drop as well. If you get a pressure drop, we're basically, we're losing the force. Uh, we've got to power with our fans a lot more than we would need it to. And we're also, um, we're also losing the heat because then the, the air will be just be pushed out through the envelope or sucked in through the envelope and we can't recover any heat from leakage flow. So what options do we have? So the, the cheap and cheerful option is, will you go with a door undercut uh, one centimeter, if I, I remember correctly, that's 2.4 inches. So you need a door undercut of about this size um, and that will do the trick. Um, however, the problem with doing this is, well, there's not just the air that gets through, then it's also noise and it's also um, light. And noise can be a particular problem. So when I did my lecture tour through North America, I think it was 2016 or 17, um, so the, the people who organized this, well, um, and, and I'm very grateful for them for doing this, they put me in a number of a passive house Airbnbs and they were, they were all fabulous houses and very nice people. But more than once <clears throat> I got the welcome, welcome, um, um, you're very welcome here, here are your earplugs, this is a passive house. And I was, initially I was wondering why? But the problem is, um, if you have your, if you go with an un door undercut as your, as your transfer opening, um, then you can't get good ac acoustic separation. And if you later intend to rent out your parts of your your apartment for Airbnb purposes, uh, that could be a problem. Um, so there are other ways of achieving um, the same outcome of transferring ear without transferring um, that much noise or light. Light is also light coming under the door is for some people that's um, a, a real problem. They don't like it. So one good, one good uh, option is to go with a gap uh, around your lintel. 
And then if you then put a bit of a sound absorber match here, uh, then so you get your ear through, um, uh, not much sound uh, will get through that way. So that is getting a reasonable outcome uh, for your acoustics and no lights can come through that way. I would also recommend this type of solution, this or some of the other more fancier solutions um, for a bathroom door. So if a bathroom door, you, we've seen there's quite a bit of air coming um, through your bathroom door because you're extracting um, half about half the volume of um, the enclosure in your bathroom. And so if you come out of the shower with wet feet, stand in front of that door and lots of air is being pushed under that door, that's not so very pleasant. So this is an alternative um, that takes care of that problem. There are also a couple of commercial overflow options that the world where you can get, use the, the door to um, get the air through. And then there are acoustic provisions there uh, that uh, prevent noise from traveling with air. Or there's, if you want to go with the undercut, there's also some uh, form of seals that you can use that let noise, uh, let air through, but keep noise and light at check. Now to get the ducted air distributed throughout the enclosure, you have two general options going with rigid ducting and a branching distribution, which is the option I prefer, um, or going with a manifold and flexible ducts. Um, the branching option does require planning ahead because, well, the ducts are wider and well, they're rigid. Um, so you need to have spaces for them. Yeah, you can't easily bend them around corners or get them out, get around things. So you need to have you need to have provisions for them. There are also acoustic. You also need some acoustic provisions because it's well quite conceivable that you do have otherwise crosstalk, uh, a crosstalk situation between those branches. Um, so this is with the manifold situation, you, you have more flexibility. And if you haven't designed your building to, to, to work with a ventilation system or in a retrofit situation, that might be an option to still get good outcomes. Um, acoustically, it's also uh, a better well, you don't need any acoustic provisions typically here because it's well not very conceivable that you has cross talk from here through the manifold back into another room. What sort of ducts do we need? We need ducts that are smooth on the inside that uh, stay accessible for cleaning because occasionally you want to check whether they need a good clean and uh, they need to be as short as possible. Um, two will reduce resistance, not lose the force, but also um, to save on costs. They need to be wide enough for the flow rate, um, otherwise you create resistance and noise. They need to be insulated when you have a camp temperature gradient to the environment. And if you're carrying cold air in a duct, um, they also need to be, have that insulation to be vapor tight. You want minimal bends and constrictions, and you don't want any electrostatic charging, which is particularly a concern if you go with polymer ducts, plastic ducts. They need to be coated to prevent electrostatic charging. Otherwise, if they charge up, they all dust particles in air will cling to the surfaces and block them over time. So this is, this is an example of, well, the same room layout and uh, going with a manifold um, solution or a branch, branching solution. Um, here's another example. So, and you can guess why I prefer the branching solution because it's, well, it's sort of, it's cleaner. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah just aesthetically more pleasing, I find. And there are also advantages. Well, the, currently the ex lifetime, life expectancy between the rigid ducts and the flexible ducts, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of a difference. So your, your rigid ducts are likely to last a bit longer. 
Um, whatever you do for your ducting, um, I would always uh, recommend you try to make use of the Quanda effect. Um, Quanda effect is basically the same mechanisms that keeps airplanes up in the air. It's the tendency of a jet stream to attach to adjacent surfaces um, and the fast flowing air stream creates a vacuum above it um, and which sucks the air upwards. That way the air provided here travels along the ceiling to the opposite wall where it drops down. So you get pretty good mixing uh, for that uh, if you use this effect. You need overall shorter duct lengths um, and as even in a passive house there's not much stratification but under the ceiling well the air might be still half a degree warmer than down here and by traveling along the ceiling you get a bit of a pre-warming uh, for the air before it drops down and getting gets into your comfort zone. So you need to place a a, a nozzle outlet because you, no, you need a nozzle because you need fast moving air for this to happen. Um, 15 to centimeter, be, 20 centimeter below the ceiling. You can also suspend from the ceiling. Um, and this looks like you then need to place it somewhere in the middle again, which sort of would define the purpose of saving on duct lengths. But these, with these elements, you can block, um, you can block, um, three quarters and therefore put it in the corner and uh, suspend it from the ceiling. Couple more, couple more options for your outlets. Um, um, I'm currently building a passive house for myself. Um, this is the nozzle type I go with for quanta effects. Um, I, I, I like the I like the look of it um, and I also like the variability of it and the sort of low tech variability of it. Um, so with this type of outlet to achieve quanta effect you're taping over all the rows of holes that you don't need. Yeah? So depending on how much volume you need. So I will I will I will tape over this, the, the lower part here will tape and then the upper part will be uh, 15 centimeter below the ceiling and then blow against the ceiling and hopefully um, let me get a good outcome for mixing of the room. All right, I'm getting towards the end of what I wanted to share with you. Um, um, there's one, there's a bit of um, research coming out of Australia that I think I would like to share with you because it could be pertinent to uh, the situation in North America as well and that's uh, particles. Um, particles indoors are typically from indoor activities so from cooking food, lighting fires, candles, insect sticks, burning stuff. Or they could be from sanding or scratching your head, things like these. Actually when I deploy particle readers in buildings to monitor particle concentration, um, the, the way I tested whether they worked was scratching my, putting them somewhere, scratch my head. If I got a large particle reading, then they worked. Um, but occasionally particles in indoor air originate outdoors, um, such as was the case with the Australian bushfires. And as you can see here with the yellow line, um, um, F7 filtration, um, so the, 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 F, is the yellow line is an airtight house with um, mechanical heat recovery and F7 filtration. That already takes care of quite a bit of uh, the particles uh, from outdoor EM. So red line would be um, red line would be an air leaky building. Blue line is um, outdoor concentrations. So the the yellow line is already faring quite a bit better with the peaks in outdoor concentrations than the uh, house without any filtration. But um, once you have a ducted system, it's um, also possible to well, go even further and improve your indoor particle situations um, even, even more. Um, and in this case, the occupant put a homemade HEPA filter box in front of their air intake. 
uh, with this DIY contraction, um, the yellow line again here, um, indoor concentrations were kept below recommended values most of the time. Um, now you wouldn't want to use a HEPA filter as standard in a passive house as it increases the airflow resistance quite significantly and therefore increases the power usage significantly. Um, but there are times when you need more filtration. And if you have a central ducted air intake, it is relatively easy to temporarily increase the amount of stuff you filter from outdoor air. And you cannot do this with window ventilation. This ends my presentation. Um, very happy to take questions now. So thanks, uh, thanks, Kara, for a great presentation. Yeah, we, we have um, we have a couple of questions here. I think the first one you probably or answered with the HEPA filter, uh, which of course becomes a more important questions, uh, especially in the West uh, with the wildfire. So I think uh, I think a temporary HEPA filter, obviously, that's a good idea. Where would you implement that HEPA filter in the blocking system? So they just built they just built a a box, as I understand it, that was um, put just in front of the exterior um, where the air intake was. So that was, well, a DIY option. Um, I think probably it's good. I'm hoping so it's not that as easy as switching the filter in your air handling unit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so um, generally, I, I well, I hope that manufacturers will make that easier in future. But there's also the option to, there's currently already the option, and I actually like that option um, to go, instead of with the inbuilt filters in your air handling unit, to put a separate filter box in front of your, in front of your air handling unit, right? So the advantage of going with a separate filter box is the filter is one of the other places in, well, is, is the place in your ventilation system with the highest airflow restriction, even if it's clean. And that will, if it's getting dirtier and dirtier, it, it will reduce, it will even more, be more of a restriction. Um, and the, the larger your filter, you're less the restriction, right? The airflow restriction. Therefore, going and but in the, in your putting it, the filter in your air handling unit just does not there's not enough space for it, right? So therefore, going with a separate filter box in front of your air handling unit is a good idea because then you can make the filter far larger. You can go, go with large pocket filters, and then it should also be easier if you have a separate filter box to change the filter quality and go with HEPA filters then. So you, you place it in the incoming fresh air stream yes. before yes. the ERP. Yes. Okay, so we have another question by Paul. Maybe Paul, you can unmute yourself and uh, probably you, you, you ask a question, it's a, a long one. Uh, I was just interested in the graph you had up earlier, Cara, um, yeah. showing the parts per million in the Auckland houses. I just wondered if you're aware of any studies that have linked um, sleep improvement and performance. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to err along the uh, improvement to the general economy by people who sleep well, but whether or not there is any, any reports on improved sleep and improved performance in the workplace from those living in passive houses. So. Um, um, let, let me try if I understand your question correctly. You're asking, are there any studies that are, well, that are quantifying health benefits of, um, of proper ventilation? Yeah. Unfortunately, not that I'm aware of. There's no study which, which shows the, the benefits of a better or lower carbon level in your, carbon dioxide level in your building in a passive house? Well, there's no, there's this, well, there, we, we all know that high CO2 concentrations indoors are a problem, right? So there are studies that say that, mm. but there's, I'm not aware of any studies that say, um, well, if your CO2 concentration level is such, um, then the burden to the health system is lessened by that amount. So I'm not aware of studies like this. 
would be good to have them. So I would encourage everyone to, to try and undertake these type of studies. And so there's a question by David. He, um, he's asking, could you outline a, a non-ducted air supply system? How would that look like? A non-ducted air supply system. So this is well, there, there are a variety of, of options there. Um, basically, you'll be perforating your so you you'll have a duct within the in well non-ducted system where the duct is a bit of an oxymoron, but that duct sits in your in your envelope, and in that duct you have you have a heat recovery core, or well, sometimes it's something that sits in front of the duct that has the heat recovery core. But you have, so you have a fan in, in, the, in the duct or in front of it, rather than a central fan um, somewhere then ducted from there. Um, so this is, well, it's, it's an, an option I would consider in a retrofit or in a tiny house or we're really going with a centrally ducted system, doesn't make economic sense, right? But for if you have the choice to go with ducted system, so if you have a normal size <clears throat> building and there's space for your ducts, um, I would prefer the ducted system. With the ducted system, you only have two penetrations of your thermal envelope mm -hmm. uh, on the on the where your, your air intake is and your exhausting air. With the uh, with the um, decentralized system, <clears throat> ductless system, you have a penetration of your thermal envelope in every room, or at least sometimes they're communicating, or at least um, in in a lot more places. Um, that means you've got to air tighten all of them. Uh, you've got to yeah get the connection right, but also you have. You then have in your bedroom a fan, and even if it's a, even if it's a noise reduced fan, even if it's a fan that isn't very noisy, um, I would still be bothered by it, right? So um, I, yeah, it, it would still. Some people can still perceive it. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, so if there's a, and, and so you you you. You get efficiency gains. Um, you don't need to penetrate your thermal envelope all that much, um, and there are probably some, some slight acoustic um, improvements with the possible with the. Oh, the other thing is. Oh, yeah, 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 before I forget, uh, filtering incoming air is then also not possible or very difficult. Um, and the other thing is, so many of those systems. Um, they're exhausting and inhaling through the same duct, right? Mm -hmm. So that means your outgoing air ha uses the same airways as your incoming air. Yeah, that means any contaminants, bacteria, whatever, in outgoing air. Well, there's a chance that they cling to this duct and are swept in again with the incoming air. So it's 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 an option, um, but and and sometimes you don't have a choice, and sometimes it's much well, it's certainly much better than not having any form of ventilation with heat recovery. But um, if you have the choice to go ducted cascading, that would be my preference. Mm -hmm. Do you have a do you have an opinion on 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 the transmission uh, contamination cross contamination in a heat recovery core? Uh, concerned uh, the, the the virus, the COVID virus. Do you have any? I, I don't. I can't be certain. Um, I haven't seen any research as to. Uh, so typically, with uh, with modern heat recovery cores, with it's typically a polymer core, mm -hmm. right? It's a core. It's a polymer membrane, and I would assume um, that this polymer membrane is impervious to viruses and bacteria. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% certain. Um, so the, I think the, what, what currently the concern is with ventilation and COVID is uh, recirculated air. And in a passive house, you wouldn't use recirculated air. Um, so that is the advantage that you have. And, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm currently, I'm assuming that um, the polymer membrane will not let um, bacteria and viruses through. Also, we considering that, hmm, so it's it's not like there's the the air has a lot of time to dwell there, right? So it's it's the, it's pushed through quite rapidly. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think there is a risk, but I haven't seen any research confirming that. So Dean is asking, why wouldn't you use a manifold system where air is provided and taken from each room? That way you don't need to undercut doors or worry about acoustics. Okay, so the question as I understand it, and Dean, correct me if I'm wrong, is you're asking why go with a cascading system where you only extract from some rooms and supply it from, from to other rooms, why not go with two ducts into every room? <clears throat> uh, it's, mainly, it's mainly a cost thing, right? So um, the outcomes aren't better if you get the transfer situation uh, right. And it's not that hard to do it if if you know what to look for. Um, so so yeah, you would just you would have to you would have to um, you would have to go with a duct with two ducts minimum. So sometimes depending on room size, you need two ducts to begin with if it's a larger room. So and if it's a larger room, you then would need two ducts supply, two ducts extract. That adds cost and complexity and there's not that much gain. The only thing you need to, with the cascading system, the only thing you need to consider is, well, just allowing the air to get back. And there are solutions, there are commercial solutions, there are DIY solutions to this that work quite well if you consider the usage of the, your spaces. Have you seen a, a passive house which uses uh, that kind of a system? I mean, I, I actually have never seen one. Um, yes, I've seen a, a commercial project that mm -hmm. was using this and with a commercial project that might be because, well, so the cascading system, um, you, for balancing things, you need, well, you need extracts rooms, you need about the same, ex yeah, you need the same extraction as supply. In a commercial project that might be challenging, yeah, because your, your, your kitchen areas or, or toilet areas are typically not well compared to the other spaces that you need to ventilate that there's it's difficult to balance uh, so yes i've seen it in one uh, passive house commercial project mm -hmm. where um, supply and extract was to the same rooms so i think uh, um, we are at the end of our, our time i would like to to thank you Kara, for your presentation and um, Pleasure. thanks everyone for for joining us tonight thanks Great. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining me. And I hope you got something out of it. And well, have a good night. I'll be starting my day now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. See ya. See ya. Thanks, everyone.